Hey, this is Andy Jenkins, and welcome to episode number 15 of the Warrior Hope Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to bring you the story of a soldier. Now, here's what we do on the Warrior Hope Podcast. About a third of the time, I try to bring you the information from a professional, uh, like we did last week. Dr. Sarah Gillum is a licensed, credentialed professional featured in honoring the code, wrote the forward to our book, Hope for the Warrior Family, uh, is featured in our, our video class, um, Warrior Hope, that's available online on our website. And so we, we try to bring you someone like her who is a professional, uh, even if they're not a PhD, they're serving somewhere in the field as some sort of authentically awesome service provider. About a third of the time, we try to bring you some of the content that we've written, that we've put together. It might be something that we've taught from the stage. It might be something that we've written in a book. It might be something that we just uh, kind of solo. I jump on and say, hey, let, let me talk to you about, and then just fill in the blank of, of any topic. And so in episode two, we talked about post-traumatic stress. In episode four, I came on and talked about moral injury. In episode seven, I talked about uh, emotional health being part of overall total health. About a third of the time, it's not a service provider, it's not someone on the Crosswind staff, it is an actual veteran, uh, someone who has a story to tell. So in this one, I'm going to introduce you to my friend Michael Tureen. Michael served in the Army from 1990 to 94, and then he was in Alabama National Guard from 94 on through to 2009. So, so you added up almost 19 years there, almost 20, of being a soldier. Uh, now, he, he deployed to Afghanistan and, and Iraq, where he served as a scout, providing security for convoys, uh, for quartermaster supply missions, uh, for fuel and essential supply deliveries. Uh, Michael saw combat during his tours. He, he left the Army as a sergeant, qualified as a scout, communication specialist, and a combat medic. In other words, this guy has, he's been over there, he's seen the action and as a result of that today Michael suffers from several medical issues that he actively discusses openly. Most people refer to the cluster of things that he's experienced as Gulf War Syndrome. Uh, they cite the burn pits, the landfills, the other contagions and toxins to which soldiers are often exposed. Michael's going to talk openly about that in this episode as he shares his story. And, and in the story, listen for this, he's going to go way back. He's going to explain how he was called into ministry when he was 16. And then again, when he was 24, he was, I guess the term would be recalled into ministry. But as he continued serving and soldiering, uh, he seeking to figure out how and when he could make that transition, it never quite happened. And then along the way, due to his illnesses, Michael lost everything. He lost his house, uh, he went bankrupt, lost his money, he lost jobs, titles, roles. Um, eventually, he lost because he had to hang up his uniform. But, and here's what I want you to hear from his story. And this is something we teach in the final chapter, chapter number 10 of Warrior Hope. And I'm gonna put a link in the show notes to the Warrior Hope book, to the Warrior Hope curriculum. Here's what we teach is regardless of where you've been, what you've been through, the training still works. U.S. military training is among the absolute best, not, not just best military training, it is among the most disciplined, uh, critical, strategic, work with other people, get it done type of training, disciplined. It instills something in you that is the best among any kind of training anywhere and the training is good for all of life and so we tell people you remain that warrior even if you've hung up the title even if you've set aside the uniform a lot of soldiers when they leave a lot of warriors when they they leave service active service there's kind of this disruption because everything's so regimented before and there is intense purpose before. There's intense 
uh, discipline before. There is a scheduled day of doing something that matters. And you see how it fits into the bigger picture. You know what the mission is. And here's what we're saying is there's a new mission and the training that you had, it's good for all of life. The discipline that you have, it's good for anything that you do. Your ability to strategize, to make things happen, to get it done, it is needed. Now, in this episode, Michael's going to remind you of something he told me that Viktor Frankl said. Viktor Frankl said, when, when a man can no longer control his circumstances, he must change himself. So Michael now spends a lot of time at home, but he's extremely active on social media, and he is doing the ministry that he once thought he would do, albeit in a different time, in a different space, in a different way. He delivers hope, encouragement, positivity daily. In his words, a lot of people are looking for something extraordinary to do. Um, But it's amidst the ordinary of everyday life that we often invest and find ourselves achieving the extraordinary. And he says that, well, I I believe you shouldn't settle for ordinary. I believe you were created for extraordinary, but you often find it by doing the next best thing that's in front of you and taken from a man who's, who's done both or done what many of us would refer to as both the ordinary and the extraordinary. Being on all these different combat tours, seeing the world, and now much of the time being confined to his house, yet telling us, hey, Here's where you can also make a difference. It's part of what we do in the Centers of Hope. What we do is really, in the end, empower warriors to identify the next mission. This is part of Michael's story. So let me introduce you to my friend right here, Michael Turin. Okay, so this is Andy Jenkins. I'm on the Zoom call hill here with Michael I'm going to pronounce it the right way, Tureen, T. That is correct. H O R I N. That hooked on phonics will not work on that, Michael. <laughs> you are right. That's it. But, <laughs> but I mean, like you said, if you try to like talk about Thompson, it's T H, but you just pronounce the T. The H is silent. So, Tureen. I can't figure out the rest of the alphabet that's in there. But Michael Tureen. Uh, man, what have you guys been up to? Because it's, you know, middle of July when we're recording this and we're still, people can't decide if we're doing quarantine or not, if we're going back to normal or if we're doing quote new normal, which is a word I'm tired of hearing, but like, talk to me, what's going on? Well, you know, that's the funniest thing is everybody keeps throwing the word social, social isolation around. Yeah. You know? Social, social distancing, social distancing. And, and I, I told everybody, look, I've been doing this for four years now. I've been socially distant from people for four years now. I mean, I'm a professional patient. So and it's not bad that, you know, the hours pretty much set your own hours, but you know, everybody makes six figures that deals with you. So, but uh, <laughs> that's my job as a professional patient. Professional Just be around for the patient. Okay. So, Let's, uh, let's go ahead and, uh, since you've said that, let's go ahead and paint the picture right now and tell everybody, because I remember uh, I met you, it was back at the beginning of 2020. We actually did the uh, Warrior Hope uh, manual uh, that we have, which we used to lead the Centers of Hope. We did the leader certification so that we could start uh, doing these Centers of Hope all over. Right after we certified everybody, quarantine hit. So everybody's like, oh, we got all this information. We're trained. But... <laughs> What do we do? So we're, we're coming up with the next steps and all of that, more details on that later on. Um, but yeah, when I, when I met you there, you, you came and it was great to meet you. Your wife was there. She was helping you a lot. You had a, a wheelchair there. Uh, let's talk about all that and just let everybody know. Cause you obviously do a lot of Facebook live. So you haven't tried to hide that part of life from anyone at all. Oh, uh, no, sir. <laughs> Um, I, I, you broke out there on the, on the last part, you just basically asking about the, the medical conditions or yeah. pretty much, um, my last deployment to, uh, uh, was in Iraq and it's, 
I, I served a couple of deployments. One of them was in Afghanistan. I was just a medic, and we got deployed out to Iraq and did convoy security and route reconnaissance. So it put me on the road all the time. Um, so we got to around, I know you've probably heard some of the stuff about burn pit registries and, you know, the, the VA is talking about Gulf War syndrome. It used to not be that big of a thing, but it's becoming a little bit more of a, they call it our modern day Agent Orange. The Gulf War syndrome yeah, describe is to that the Gulf War. so people know what that is, because we hear that phrase a lot. You'll, you'll see, I mean, honestly, we probably hear more about it through personal injury attorneys advertising, you know, because we're right. at home a lot now. So they're saying, yeah, oh, if you suffer from Agent Orange or Gulf War syndrome, describe what that is very quickly. Uh, it's basically a, a cluster of illnesses that they really haven't found a, a cause out uh, or a cause for it. The, they guess or they're thinking it's either going to be from depleted uranium because we were, you know, that's what the tank round used for armor, uh, yeah. depleted uranium stuff. And if we ever had to go do like counts or get information and intel up, we were around depleted uranium. Burn pits were big all over uh, Iraq, especially in uh a lot of air base and then TQ, which is a Marine run uh, base, which is about uh, probably about 50 kilometers west of Baghdad. And uh, these burn pits, they burn everything in it. Uh, they were burning, um, man, they, uh, anywhere from just medical waste. Uh, if they had people that had amputations or something, they would burn the limbs in it. And, Anything they could find, they just burned it because that was the best thing they could find to do with it. Okay, so uh, I met a guy, one of the centers of hope, and he said that his job was to burn, like he ran a burn pit, and he said one of the things he burned was human waste. And mm -hmm. like that was, you know, like, I mean, he actually for a while felt like an inferior soldier because he's like, what in the world? Like, I come over here to be a soldier, and I'm just <laughs> running – like I'm burning feces, you know, and then of course he did other things and he realized that was part of the necessary, you know, but right. How big were these burn pits? Like let's paint the picture of that for everybody. Um, I'm trying to think of something to compare it to. Uh, the we one that like TQ, a dumpster, or are we talking like a, uh, uh, just massive, almost like a landfill was what you'd see. It's just dump trucks would literally back up to it and dump the waste into it. They burn constantly, 24-7. Um, the one at TQ, if you had six football fields, yeah, two deep and then three back, um, if you could imagine what uh, a total of six football fields would look if they were on fire, just with nothing but trash being thrown in it 24-7. And it's, it's just, it constantly burned. Uh, so they're thinking that it may be that that's caused some of the health issues. But the cluster of illnesses pretty much goes with um, it's uh, uh, constricted bronchiolitis um, uh, and general malaise or um, chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, you also have other problems that, um, like, I got hit by a couple of IEDs, me and my crew did. And uh, it just jarred me up. So now I've got back problems from it. But my biggest thing is the the respiratory because at the last count I'm um I've only got uh, I think it's 25 percent left in my left lung is how much capacity I got left in my left one and about 40 percent left in my right lung and it also developed something called tracheobronchomalacia which usually only affects pediatric patients and it's basically when your bronchi and uh, your trachea your airways they lose their ability to maintain structural integrity and so at any given time if it's under pressure or exertion my airways can completely collapse and not let any air in whatsoever oh um, wow so those are, yeah it's a it's aggravating because it's, it's more like mine is on expiration so i can take a breath in but i just can't breathe out and it's the equivalent of having a tension pneumothorax um it's just you feel like you're about to, to bust you just can't get rid of any you can't of the, get it out Right. So it's, um, it, it gets pretty hairy when it's those times, but it also brings on chronic nausea for me. It's, um, the treatment for my respiratory is, uh, believe it or not, is uh, nebulized morphine uh, three times a day. And that keeps the airways from 
kind of acting up. And the good thing about it, since it's nebulized, you don't get the side effects of it. Uh, you don't really have a, a morphine dose. It's just basically going straight into your lungs and, and helping your airways to stay clear. And uh, the nausea, the only thing we found to do anything about that so far has been uh, Benadryl IV. So, um, <laughs> a Benadryl IV. Yes. For some reason, uh, and we found out the, I think it was like a year and a half when I was in the hospital, I, I couldn't hold any food down at all. And um, after they'd given me some uh, Benadryl, I forgot what they gave it to me for, I noticed that my nausea went away. So we started experimenting with that, and that's why they put me on the Benadryl for the nausea. But I'm pretty much all the time nauseated. 24 7, I'm pretty much at least nauseated. So um, it's frustrating because I like food, I like eating. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of one of those guys that if they're sitting in front of me and it looks good, I want to eat it. And you I just try can't it, yeah. do that. <laughs> it's, it's my favorite pastime. Jeez. Okay, so let's let's go back in the story a little bit. So you said you 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 had several deployments. Um, how how old were you when you enlisted? Seventeen. Okay, so I did, uh, I did a split op program. Um, basically, at the time, you could you could join, and uh, instead of you'd go what they call a split option, you go to basic training in yeah. the uh, between your eleventh, twelfth grade years of high school. Okay, then you'd finish up your high school, then you'd go back in, and you'd complete your active duty time. So, um, I went to basic training uh, in the summer between my eleventh and twelfth grade year of school. And uh, came back from there, went back to work, and went back to school. And uh, right after I finished school up and got my diploma, the next day I was back off active duty again. So, oh man, so like you were like right on it. So uh, first deployment, where do you go? Uh, but uh, after nine eleven, now, uh, it, man, it, it, there's so many different places. At first, as being part of the National Guard, we got pulled up to do homeland security missions. Um, we guarded the state military department for Alabama. Then we guarded, uh, of course, a bunch of the airports around. We were there. Um, then Maxwell Air Force Base and Gunner Annex of Maxwell. And let's see. Then, uh, then we did Fort Stewart. Then I went to Afghanistan. Uh, we came back to Anniston Army Depot, which is a, it, it was a treat going to Anniston Army Depot and patrolling the chemical limited area. It's because they're still trying to get rid of all the nuclear or the biological, you know, stuff at the Army Depot yeah. where they were just burn all these chemical weapons off. So um, we basically rode around for, we'd get dropped off. And for about a week and a half, we'd be in Humvees just riding around back in the woods, uh, making sure nobody was coming in the fence line. So, uh, we, uh, we got to, we got to kill some deer and, and cook the deer. And <laughs> it was, it was a unique yeah, it was it was pretty fun, and then uh, of course when I got pulled up to Iraq, uh, Iraq I got pulled up in about June of uh, June of 2005, and uh, got back home in October of 06. Uh, okay. So it was a little over a year, close to a year and a half of an appointment with them, um, and when I got back off of that. Vicky was having a hard time and the girls were having a hard time. I knew when I, when I first deployed out my, uh, my PT scores were excellent. I stayed in shape. I, I did my two mile run time in 13 minutes and eight seconds. And that's I, smoking. It, that's it. Yeah. I mean, and I had, I'd worked myself to that and I was, I was, I was happy with the advances I'd made in my physical health. And then, uh, we came back our post deployment um, or our redeployment uh, PT test. I couldn't even run half a mile, and so I thought, well, maybe it's just something that I in that quick of a time from the first deployment to Iraq to that. Well, that's what I was getting at is, you know, where where in the deployment stages did you start feeling? You know, most of the time with a physical injury. If it's uh, if it's a broken bone or something like that or a, a traumatic thing, usually you can go, oh, it happened at this specific instance. You know, you fall, you break the bone, you get shot, right. you have you have an entry and maybe even an exit wound. 
you know, you, an IED, you know, or you, that you, you, you can trace something to an actual event, but you know, with yours, it seems like you, you've, you've faced a lot of, um, I mean, any deployment is, uh, stressful, but I mean, I mean, with yours, uh, IEDs and chemical weapons and all these, like it seems, okay, there, there's lots of layers to that, that you, any of those could have been a, a precipitating event, yet right. it seems like you, you can't just pin it down and go, oh, it all happened right here. Right. So it's just the whole well, cluster or string of events. And that's the weird part about it is I know, I know, I know around when I started noticing the change in my health condition um, was around, I think it was like January of okay. uh, 2000. Um, I was having these massive headaches and uh, man, I was staying so tired. I couldn't stand it. And the headaches were, were finally getting to me enough where I went on sick call. This is um, after the first I, I hope, Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. This two, is my last. Three, all right. Okay. So you ha how many deployments did you have to Iraq? Just one to Iraq and one to Afghanistan. Okay, one. Okay, so Iraq was first, and then Afghanistan. Is that Iraq was the second, and Afghanistan was the first. We okay. We did Afghanistan in '03. Um, it's like a, I only did a four month rotation in Afghanistan as a medic, uh, and that was mainly a voluntary thing because they had uh, they had a lot of people that wanted to come home on block leave, and so they were taking any volunteers up to go, you know, yeah, work block places so um okay so before you went to iraq before that last deployment you you could run that basically two six and a half minute miles back to back two mile in 13 minutes which i mean everybody knows that's a that's a crazy pace right. um and then so, so somewhere either in that deployment or the cumulative effect of everything and that's, you know, that's the weird thing about it. I, I noticed the, the problem with the headaches. Um, found out I, I developed high blood pressure while I was there, which is also part of it. See, a lot of this stuff is, is kind of a, a snowball effect on it. Uh, when I first got back, I went back to my job as a firefighter paramedic. And, um, and I knew I was running down easier. I knew I was, I thought maybe I just wasn't conditioned or, you know, despite everything we've gone through. So I started going to the doctor, tell him, Hey, I'm having these problems breathing. And uh, my regular doctor just said, well, it's exertional asthma. Just take a nebulizer. We're going to be okay. Yeah. Um, and it kept getting worse. I got to where I was passing out. And um, my, my primary care doctor, my private doctor, he just didn't go into it a lot because, you know, at 36 years old and I look healthy and he's just thinking that maybe, I don't know. I, the hardest part about this for a lot of your Gulf War veterans right now is uh, um, it takes some extensive testing to find out what's wrong. Uh, and if you're not going to the VA and you're going to your private doctor, you get lost in the insurance. Um, because the my doctor, I was telling my doctor, hey, there's a there's a thing called Gulf War syndrome or Gulf War illness. Uh, there's some tests that you can do. And he said, well, I can't do the test because your insurance company won't pay for it. And he said, you can do it if you want to, but it'll be out of pocket. Oh, geez. So yeah, that's I, probably cost prohibitive right there. Right. So I, I didn't know what else to do. We just, uh, I just went back to uh, work and I was hoping and praying I could make it through to retirement. And uh, it just didn't happen. I passed out on the job one day. Um, we were doing evolutions at Station 6 for Hoover. And uh, I got the, uh, uh, during the training evolutions, I ended up passing out. Uh, they sent me to get looked at, and uh, it took probably a, a week before the doctors called me back and said, you've got a problem with your lungs. Um, we've got to get you in for some more testing. And uh, it, it was like probably a month later, we found out that I'd lost a, a lot of capacity of my lungs. And that was a... It was between, I started having problems in 06 till 2014. And I'll tell you the exact day when I passed out on the job was April the 1st of 2014. April well, Fool's Day. Yeah, why, yeah, I say, why do you remember that besides April Fool's Day? Or is that why you remember it? That's yeah. why I remember it. I imagine, you know, I mean, how, how old are you now? Because you got to be thinking, you're, I mean, what, what's your age right now? 
47. Okay. So, you, I mean, you're, you're close in age to me and you gotta be thinking was, a decade ago, you gotta be kidding me. Like this can't be happening. And, and, there's, and there's no discernible reason. It's just like, yeah, you're like, what in the world? Okay. So April, <laughs> April fool's day. Yeah. That's the weird part about it. I, I'll tell you, I've got, uh, I'm a little side note on this whole thing is I've, I, uh, I felt called into the ministry when I was 16 and uh, that's when I, that's when I made my decision to accept Christ. And man, I went through, I never turned away from my beliefs, but I just never ran towards them. So, you know, I didn't have anywhere to live cause I didn't grow up at home. I got booted out of the house when I was little and by the grace of God, people would just line up and let me stay with them. I always had somebody to take care of me from the time I was 13 on people just volunteering to let me do something or, or stay there. To, yeah. And I, I've just always had people in my path that have, that have been a blessing in that area. But now <laughs> I was, Vicki was working as a nurse and uh, I was working at Hoover fire department. I had two other fire department jobs on the side. We were making around 130 to 140,000 a year. And um, about three months before it was, it's probably about January. I think it was around January. I, I started feeling that call and a tug on my heart. And uh, which year was this? Uh, well, two thousand. Found about what year? Yeah. Uh, two thousand fourteen. Okay, so this is okay. This was that. That I, I just I just had this feeling that that I felt I felt like I was being called back into ministry and. At Hoover Fire Department, you have to keep watch at night. Somebody has to be awake to make sure if a call goes out that everybody gets up. So I always yeah. kept watch. I had a problem with sleeping, PTSD, and the whole nine yards with it. And so uh, one night I was sitting in the day room, and I just felt a tug on my heart. And I started bartering with God. And I, I know that I know everybody says don't ever make deals with God. I thought I was safe. And it was to the point where I was like, you know, God, I feel like, I feel like it's something you want me to do, but I don't make enough money to where I can quit a job. So, you know what? If you want me in the ministry, you're going to have to find a way to make it happen. Now, in my mind, I saw that going differently. In <laughs> yeah, my mind, course. I saw massive raise or something. And it's the weirdest thing because when the doctors, and I know it sounds weird, but when the doctors told me, that I wasn't going to be able to go back to work and that I lost a lot of capacity. The first thing I thought was, well, I can't get mad at God. <laughs> I basically so, challenged. So, I mean, this was like how, this was like three or four months before that April 1st. Right. Okay. So, and, yeah, I mean, it's, well, see, somebody, I, I've got a good friend, he's a pastor, and he said for the longest, he always felt bad because people, he just felt like they were using him. You know, he'd give money to a homeless guy, and he knew that guy was going to go use it on drugs, or he'd spend time with somebody. He knew they were just using him. And then, he, like, one day he's praying, he says, and the Lord tells him, well, hey, isn't that what you prayed? Hey, use me. Lord, use me. And he's like, I did. <laughs> so, you know, it's like you, you get the answer to the prayer, but you think often when you get the uh, – when you, when you pray the prayer, you're envisioning it in one way, and it kind of – it kind of comes out a different way and you're like, I, I should have prayed a more specific prayer. Right. That was exactly what I was thinking. I'm serious. It was a, of course, when I, my wife, Vicki, she's got lupus and um, a couple other things to go along with lupus. So she's been on a lot of medicines for a while. Um, and just to, to drive home the financial part, whenever I lost my job there, Vicky had to start staying home and taking care of me because during the first stages of this, I was in the hospital constantly. And so Vicky had to quit working to take care of me. Now it, it took two and a half years for the VA payment to come in and social security and everything. We lived off of about 20,000 or about $20,000 a year for that two year period. We lost our house. We lost our cars. We had to file bankruptcy. We lost every bit of money we have in savings. We lost everything. I mean, you, you and uh, the base level. I mean, this is all right. So this is like the story really of Job where, I mean, you didn't lose your wife and kids, but I mean, everything else, this is, and this is all in a very quick time frame. It's got to just yeah. be, 
I mean, now you can, you can talk about it with a little bit less emotional attachment because it's several years ago, but this has got to be radically devastating at the time. You know, that's the weird part about it is I really thought my entire life, I wanted two things. I wanted to be in the army and I wanted to be a fireman. As long as I can remember, those were the two things I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, I, I look back now and I always thought that if, if I ever had that taken away from me, because those, those things were how I help people. Yeah. That was what I do. And, uh, I always thought, you know, this is, this is me. I'm a fireman. I was an army. I'm tough. This is what I want to do. And you have this thing in your mind where you're always going to be invincible. And, uh, then April Fool's Day gets there and you realize you're not. <laughs> and, uh, Oh, and not but only are you not invincible, none of your stuff is invincible either. Right. And, you know, that's the weird part about it is we have a, a – I, I never got upset. I never got mad. I never got uh, – I still haven't been disappointed about anything. And we have a lot of hard times around here. Um, we've got the money back. And when they finally started paying, they caught us back up with everything. Yeah. And so now we're, we're – back in a nice house, it's nothing fancy, but it's what we have and it's, it's all we need. And, um, all those things that were, that were there, uh, we just kept praising God through all of it. And you also have to understand that when I first got back from Iraq, Vicki and the girls, they, they should have never stayed with me. Um, I treated Vicki like dirt. I never was physically abusive to any of them, but words, can sometimes hurt a lot worse than a, a fist can. And uh, it took, it took about two years of me having a change in my life before Vicki would actually believe it. Uh, there were four separate times that I tried to kill myself uh, during the course when I got back to when all this stuff had happened. And the weirdest thing was whenever I found out that, you know, hey, there is a problem with my lungs. And, you know, the initial thing was the doctor said maybe 10 years of quality of life, maybe less. It just depends on what we can do. It, it was weird. It was like after that, I was, you know, why in the world would I be wanting to throw that all away? I look back now and I see pictures of grandkids. And, man, I think, man, I almost, you know, it. everybody goes through rough times. Everybody has hard times. And, I almost cheated myself out of getting to witness some of the most amazing miracles in this world. And, uh, but because of the illnesses, my look, this is weird. When you talk about Job, I'm, I'm telling you the story is basically a Job story because my mom and dad got divorced when I was two months old. And, uh, I talked to my dad probably a handful of times in my entire life when all this stuff started happening. Um, I started feeling this, urge to call him and talk to him because I kept thinking what, what kind of person, if his dad died, wouldn't be emotional or upset, you know, yeah. I don't even. So I called him to talk to him and we started talking all the time and long story short, uh, within a year he was calling me asking if he could marry mom. Oh, wow. Now he was in Illinois and he ended up moving out here. My mom and I, we never were close. Of course, me and him were never close either. And yeah. I just never was a part of the family um, just because of the way things happened when I was growing up. And and from that point, from him coming back, my mom had the very first picture of our entire family together. And I got to spend a lot of quality time with my dad. My attitude, my, my attitude shifted whenever all this stuff started happening. If it weren't for this, if it weren't for me being sick, uh, we would, and it maybe things would have worked out, but I honestly believe that this was God's wake up call for me. And I believe everything happens for a reason. I believe yeah. that the scriptures is specific about it. And, um, all of this stuff brought my family back together and all this stuff has kept me and Vicki and the girls together. And, I just can't see everybody looks at it and says, man, I hate that you're going through all this stuff. I hate that you got this. I hate that you're in this chair, but there's nothing bad about it. 
you know, everybody's going to die one day. And I, I hope I didn't break some bad news to you. <laughs> We're all going to die. The, the cost of living is dying. Yeah, everybody and there's no way out at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not, I'm literally laying up my treasures in heaven. That's the reason why we started doing videos. I started doing the, the videos and stuff to the ministry was because I just wanted people to know that it doesn't matter how bad it gets or how sick you are, how much money you don't have, that you can always have joy in the midst of all those situations. But you can't have joy outside of, you can't have that peace and joy outside of what Christ can offer. Um, if I didn't have that, I just don't see how I could keep moving or keep going on. Um, it's a, and plus, you know, I lost three good friends while we were over there. And I, I keep thinking, man, their families would absolutely love to have them back in the condition that I'm in. You know, if, if they could have just another minute with them and they were having the medical problems I did, they would think they were blessed. Right. And so the last thing I want to do is squander this life. Um, because at least if I do something with this life I've got, it honors their lives, you know? Yeah. I, I had a friend, uh, he passed uh, about two years ago and it's about two and a half years ago as of the time that we're recording this. And I remember uh, after that, maybe five, six months ago or five, six months after the funeral, uh, his, his wife, you know, who was at that point a widow, she posted something online that it, it really spoke to that. And it, it said something to the effect of, you know, he was, he was sick. He was struggling with an addiction. Um, he had a lot of issues that most people knew nothing about. She did. And, and she said, you know, he, he was broken as in some sense we all are. It's just some people's brokenness is a little bit more obvious than other people's. Um, right. whether it's because of an emotional outburst or whether it's because of a physical wound, but everybody has some degree of brokenness. And she said, again, she said it so much more articulately than I, I will right now. But at, at the end of this post, she said, I would take broken and alive together over dead and gone anytime. And it, it really makes you kind of reframe it. Now, I, I don't know that somebody that's not in her position could, could, could just slap a Bible verse on it and say, Hey, ship her up, you know, st get it all together. Be happy. I mean, you know, any more than, I mean, I, I was talking to Sarah Gillum on a podcast and, you know, I talked about Job's friends and how everything seemed to be going okay with Job when no matter how horrible it is, when the friends are just sitting in the ash heap with him. It's only when they start talking and start pontificating and then blaming him that things go bad. And I think a lot of times that's what people want to do. When things seem to look on the surface as if they're going bad, people want to pontificate. They get into bumper sticker theologies. They throw something loose and cheap, you know, just kind of sling it out there and see what sticks. Uh, I, I don't know that in this woman's situation, anybody could have thrown something out there. It took somebody that had kind of walked the terrain, uh, not just studied the map, but actually walked through just the pit that could actually say, hey, you know, once, once you're here, there's a certain clarity that you get that you don't understand in the beginning, but you start to see glimpses of, and they may come slowly that even if it's not what you expected at first, and even if it's painful, and even if many times you, you want to lose your mind, you simultaneously start seeing that the Lord works together all things for the good. And there's a tension in that because you have to admit, hey, some things aren't whole as they will be. Yet at the same time, even in the brokenness, all things still work together for the good. And it, one doesn't, doesn't negate the other. Right. I, I tell you what, the, the, the perfect, uh, to me, the perfect example, and it's not a, it's not a, uh, have you ever, have you ever read the book Man's Search for Meaning, Victor no, Frankl? I, 
No, but I've, I've, I've heard of it. Well, I, I read parts of it when I was in seminary. I think I was supposed to read the entire thing, but it, that's the, the Cliff Notes version is probably the absolute best because he has he has three quotes in there that are absolutely to me. It's uh, one of them is when a man can no longer when a man can no longer change the circumstances, he is forced to change himself. It means that if, if if at the point I can't control my health anymore, I can't control these things. So then I have to control how I react to these things. Everybody yeah. thinks uh, you know. Everybody thinks that we're I don't know. A lot of people would feel trapped in, in, in a situation where they're sick. And well, and people think if the, if people say if only the circumstances were better, I would be better or I would act better. And, and you think back, go, well, m maybe not. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it gets back to the way everybody keeps saying we had, uh, you know, it, I think, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of friends that, uh, that I talk to and debate that are atheists. And uh, the one thing they always keep saying is about free will. And they always get down to free will. And I, I, I firmly believe that the only reason that there was the, and I, and I, it means a lot to this part of it because we talk about things we wouldn't do if we would have been there. Yeah. The whole reason why the tree was there in the first place was so we could really have free will because if God was standing in front of us and said, look, you're going to worship me, then we don't have a choice. Right. Now, if God said, there's one thing out there that you don't need to do. And that's how you get your free will. Well, that's how, well, we, we partook of that fruit. Anybody would have done the same thing. I think we're, we're mankind. We are, we are flawed by nature. So we start talking about free will and you know what? To me, it just gets to the fact that, that people, people have a lot more free will than what they think they do in, in the way we handle things and the way we perceive things. And, um, I know I just got off the sidetrack there. It's another one of those problems with that, um, that medicine. But, uh, basically if we, if we understand we got free will, then everything that I'm going through now is to me, it's, it's, it's a badge of honor. Um, because if I can go to bed at night and I can sit down and go, you know, man, I've, I've been through the ringers today. I've been, Growing up nonstop, I haven't been able to breathe good. I'm I'm slipping back into congestive heart failure now um, because we got more fluids that are retaining, and it's part of that whole thing that goes to us. So my breathing's been getting worse over the past few days. My, my nausea's been getting worse. And everything's been getting worse. Yeah. Um, but the people that watch the videos don't know it unless I just specifically say this is what's going on today, and I, I'm doing it for a purpose. I'm letting you know for a purpose. I, the entire time that we were bankrupt and broke, nobody knew we were having financial problems. And it wasn't because I was ashamed of it. It's because it didn't make any difference to the message that I wanted to, wanted to convey. You know, and if somebody found out that we were having financial problems and they could see me smiling and laughing and cutting up to me, that's our, that's our book. That's we, we have an obligation as Christians in this nation, especially in this nation to be the physical evidence that God exists. When you talk to atheists and everything and they, you know, you can't quote scripture to an atheist because it, well, if they don't believe in God, then the book's a moot point. Right. So the physical proof of God in this world today to people that, that don't accept Christ, the only physical proof is us and the way we live our lives. Because if we don't, if we don't act like we believe what we're trying to sell, then there's no reason why they should. And there's like three of the friends that I've got, that have, you know, they've all told me, man, we've been watching you and you never change. And we just kept hoping we could find something different, but it's just the way I've been for, for the last few years. I just, if we really stay in the word and we really study the word, we're either going to make ourselves slaves to sin or we're going to be servants of Christ. There's no other way around it. You, you could be one or the other. You, either way, there's some kind of servitude involved in it. You can either be a slave to sin or a servant for Christ. And in being that servant for Christ, if we put everybody above ourselves, not because we think we're useless, but because 
that was the example that Christ set for us. And all these other problems that we're experiencing in the world today change. And my sick, whether I'm sick or whether I'm healthy, doesn't change the fact that I can be a part of a change that would help people, no matter how sick I am, no matter what. And if we all did that as Christians, then, you know, this nation would take a big turnaround. So I know I got us all off the track on that thing. I'm sorry, but that's no. the, uh, that, that's the Finnegan talking. The Finnegan. No, that, I mean, that's part of the story though. It's, it's part of the, you know, I, I think where we were when the story was, you know, that January of 2014, you were staying up and you're at the firehouse and keeping watch and really having this moment with the Lord where you felt like you were going to go into ministry somehow. A lot of things are going to have to change for you to do that. By April, you get the April 1st, some physical things come on you. Um, and, and then all of life kind of upends. And so now um, it, it seems like the platform that you do have is uh, probably not to be socially distanced, but to be physically distanced for the most part. Uh, cause you're not getting in a car and driving to the firehouse every day. Uh, I mean, right. I, I saw you when you came to the leader certification, uh, for, uh, the warrior hope material, you know, I mean, it, it, it was an effort for you to get out of the car and get in there and get, get situated, get settled. Um, but, but now there's a lot that you do through Facebook, through online connection. And I think it's, you know, maybe there's this idea that the circumstances don't determine your calling or your value or worth as an individual or what, you know, has been put inside of you to bring to other people. Um, certainly the uniform you wear may change. Uh, the place where you carry out the mission may change. Uh, the way in which you can even do the mission may alter radically, but that mission, that call, you know, it's still the same. Right. If you go back to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, you know, by grace you're saved. It's the gift of God, not of works, so nobody should boast. God did this because he planned before time began these great works that you would walk in. And so a lot of life is really discovering what what is that, great thing that you're going to walk in. And I think, you know, people are created for greatness. There's not a need to settle for ordinary when there's extraordinary inside of you. And so often that right. extraordinary is lived out in the means of ordinary everyday life, but there's some extraordinary gift that can be expressed in that ordinary time and space. So I don't, I don't think you got us off track. Uh, what, what, what else, you know, we're kind of, winding in our time here, what else would you leave with people that you would want them to know? And I'm going to leave them the link to your Facebook feed there where they can get on and check your videos and see the stuff that you do. Uh, I, you know, the only thing that I really, when I, when I leave this world and my time's done, um, I don't care about what I physically leave for anybody. Uh, my name is not as important as it used to be. I just I always wanted a good reputation, but the biggest thing that I'm going to leave the world with is just the knowledge that we, I guess it, here's, and I, it's something I came up with a while back. The inability to obtain perfection is no excuse for not trying to be perfect. And I think too many Christians nowadays, we look at, you know, well, 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 I accept Christ, I'm good. All right, I, I said the prayer, I'm good. And the one thing that I believe hurts Christians the most, and my granny said to me all the time when I was growing up, is, you know, well, the only perfect person there ever was, they crucified him. And it's almost like saying, don't even worry about trying because you're not going to make it. And that's the big thing is we, a lot of times we sell ourselves short on exactly how we could live, uh, the, the things we could do. Um, and I, I think if we really put our minds to things, we can and really, really sit down with God. We're capable of a lot more than what we think we are. 
Yeah. And, I mean, how about the talk about the faith of a mustard seed? Uh, back in the biblical times, people saw miracles. There are miracles happen around us every day. We just don't see them. You know, if back in the biblical times, if they saw Jesus and he was doing all these miracles, then when he said they weren't limited by what they could see with their mind. In other words, you know, hey, if I've got the faith to make this happen, I, I could I could say to this tree, get up and move tree. You know, what if that wasn't really a saying? What if you you could be that close to God, that in touch with God, things like this, but we don't we just don't experience that kind of faith anymore. Um, and I guess I say all that to say this, we, we have opportunities every day to make life better for everybody. I did an experiment one time when I was still able to get out and I was going to physical therapy. I made it a point every time I passed somebody by in the hallways of the hospital, I'd smile at them and go, Hey, how are you doing today? And I did it every time I went there every day. And no matter what these people were doing, they might be looking at the phone. They would stop and look up and they get a big smile on their face. And now they don't know me unless they stop and ask me questions. But I'd like to think that when they stop, they don't expect people to really honestly be interested in them, to actually be concerned about them enough to say anything. And as Christians, that's what, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be spreading that smile. We're supposed to be spreading that love. And I don't have to make a certain amount of money to do it. I don't have to have a certain health to do it, but you just have to have a heart to do it. And we can change lives all day long just by two or three simple words and a smile. So, but see, I go to the hospital and Vicki, Vicky gets mad at me because every time I go to the hospital, I get put in or something. Uh, the doctors all come to my room. Uh, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating on this. They literally doctors come in my room to duck out and hide to huh. get away from me. And uh, man, people would come in my room all the time and they just wanted to come in there and talk to me. They just wanted to laugh and cut up. We didn't necessarily talk about much of anything. We would talk about scripture every once in a while, but it was an inviting place for them to come in. So that's what I told Vicki. I said, I, I never, I never go to the hospital because I'm sick anymore. Uh, God makes a way for me to go to the hospital because somebody there needs him. And I'm going to be able to say something to somebody that's going to help them out. Yeah. So I'm not, I don't ever go to the hospital because I'm sick. I go there because God sends me there. So, and it also makes you feel better because it feels like you got some control in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You got something. That's why the uncertainty. <laughs> well, I, I, that, that may be kind of, you know, one of the things we were getting at earlier was, you know, so many, so many people are looking for kind of the extraordinary thing they're supposed to do for this huge venue, for a big platform, for a big role, a big title, a big job. And, you know, the reality is maybe we're looking for the wrong thing. Like maybe it's, we need to look for the ordinary of life, but be, be extraordinary in those venues. Be like, bring that greatness to normal everyday life rather than waiting for great, some great thing that's out there. Everybody's like waiting for, you know, a lightning bolt or something like that. That's out there. Right. Whereas like, if it's just in the normal grind of everyday life, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of what's going around around us, we, we can just bring that greatness into that moment. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, you've captured and started doing, really well um and, and it's helped you overcome adversity it's inspired others it's uh, de definitely calls others to pause and think okay there's there's something bigger and greater going on here um man thank you so much for uh the, the time here and for sharing i'm, I'm going to put a link in the show notes where people can get on and they can uh follow you on facebook and catch up your videos is there anything else you want to say as we as we close out. Um, 
I can't really think anything right off hand, but uh, you might have covered it all, man. <laughs> I know. I think I might have done everything. Yeah. I just uh, you know for anybody that listens, man, we can all. I don't know. We there's so much potential inside of us. Right. Make this world change. We keep talking about, well, and I promise this will be the end of it, but we keep talking about, well, you know, we took God out of schools, we took God out of schools. And I, 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 I cringe when I hear that because if we're telling our kids that God's omnipotent, God's omnipresent, God's all powerful, but then we tell our kid they get God out of school, what well, kind of a, you know, our kids can pray at school all day long if they want to. Our kids can read a Bible in school if they want to. The only reason that God's not in the schools is because we're not recognizing as being there. It may not we be formal. Them. Yeah, it may not be formal, but it could be reality. Right. Anywhere you go, you take that light. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Like everybody gets, everybody got mad whenever uh, Obama said that uh, we're no longer a Christian nation. And then when Trump got back in, everybody went crazy because he said we are. Here's the problem with us. As so a somebody nation. says it, and it's so right. Either way. Yeah. Yeah. But other countries don't look at the president and go, man, they're a Christian nation. They look at the news. And right, right. now, if you look at the, what's going on in this nation, we're not a Christian nation. There's nothing hospitable that's portrayed on the news. So we we have an obligation to to God and our country to to make something change, do something. Yeah. <laughs> go pray, something, anything. <laughs> yeah. Make it a little bit better. All right, yes. man. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a good word, right? There.